This morning we're, uh, as I mentioned before, deviating just um, a week from the uh, Gospel of Mark. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Paul wrote the, uh, the letter to the Romans to explain to them the, the gospel more fully. The church in Rome had already been established by believers probably converted uh, at the day of Pentecost. Uh, Paul indicates that he had actually never been to Rome, but was hoping to be there that he might encourage them and might be encouraged by them. But um, in case his trip was delayed, he wrote this letter to them explaining to them the gospel. Now this particular chapter we're looking at has to do with that transformation that Paul says will take place in our lives if we are truly believers and he tells them why that transformation will take place. It's because if we've trusted Jesus, we have died with him. If we have trusted Jesus, we have also been raised with him to newness of life and that should have a profound impact on the way that we live. Let me read this, um, uh, just the first 14 verses of Romans chapter 6 as we begin. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? And again, just the argument to this point is simply this, that um, our sins uh, the Lord is using to uh, bring glory to his name. He's, he's reversed the curse that's come through Adam and so forth through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants to answer the objection, should we just go on sinning then since the Lord is using our sin for his glory? Doesn't that give us a great excuse uh, to sin more so that God can glorify his name more. Well, he says, no. No, that's not the case. He says in verse 2, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. May the Lord bless uh, his word to our hearing this morning. Now, this is the text for the morning and for the evening message. Uh, this morning we're going to focus on being dead to sin and this evening on being alive to righteousness. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing. Now, as I've said, uh, I, I think I've already explained to you why it is that um, we're, we're not in the Gospel of Mark this week, uh, because actually of a providential uh, mistake that we made to announce the, the evangelistic service, which is really uh, next Lord's Day, this Lord's Day, but it works out quite well so that we can deal with these two subjects this morning and this evening. But in doing so, we're basically kicking off um, well, a, a series of sorts uh, for the evening service. Uh, last week, we finished up the attributes of God. 
and why we should love God for every one of his perfections. Well, the fact that um, uh, we have died with Christ and been raised again now to newness of life really is telling us that we've got to stop in light of these things, hating God and begin to love him. It's just simply another way of saying that. Because when we die to self, when we die to the old man, what we're really doing is dying to that hatred that we had for God as we came into the world. And when we talk about living to righteousness or being raised to life with Christ, we're really talking about loving God, just simply another way of putting it. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but the Lord made us alive by putting his love within us. The old terms for these two things were mortification and vivification, the putting to death of the old self and the putting on of the new self or putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible has different ways of describing it, but it really is the same thing. In Christ, we have died to sin, but we have also been raised with him again to life, to righteousness, and certainly that should affect the way that we live. Now, let's take a few moments to open our subject from this passage. So the introduction is going to be just a bit, a bit lengthy, but we are going to get to, of course, the, the part of how um, we have died to sin, what that means, and um, how that should affect or what that should look like in our lives. But let's begin by just looking at this text for a moment. Now, I've already mentioned that Paul here is answering the question, should we continue in sin, should we continue to sin, so that God's mercy might become more visible and his grace might be more magnified. I mean, after all, when the Lord sent his son into the world to uh, die for our sins and he turns us around from our wickedness and puts us in the path of righteousness, doesn't that uh, uh, bring glory to God? Isn't that a very conspicuous change? People can see it and know that Jesus Christ is alive. Well, if that initial change brings glory to God, why not just keep turning around again and going that direction again and turning around again that the Lord might be glorified even more. Well, Paul says, uh, no, that, that's not the way God wants to be glorified. He wants to turn you around once, okay, and get you going the right direction. Paul basically says this in the strongest way it can possibly be said, even as uh, Jesus rebuked Peter in the strongest way possible. God, well, actually, Peter rebuked Jesus, God forbid that this should ever happen to you. Paul says here, may this never be. May it never happen. May it never even come into the realm of possibility. May it never even be thought. Now, why does Paul say this? Well, I think the answer is especially important. Well, it's important to us, but I think it's especially important to those, as I mentioned earlier, who believe that God does not really require obedience from his children or those who fail to understand the degree to which God really wants us to change and the degree to which he wants us to obey. If you belong to Jesus, you must not continue to sin. As a matter of fact, I would go further and say you cannot continue to practice sin. And why is that? Well, Paul tells us here, it's because you have died to sin. If you have been baptized into Jesus Christ, you have been baptized into his death, you have died with Jesus. Now, I should divert here for a minute to explain what that means because Paul here <clears throat> is not talking about water baptism because water baptism cannot kill the old man. Water baptism cannot put you in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people who believe that. There's even whole denominations devoted to that. The Church of Christ believes that that's what water baptism does. The Lutheran Church actually will say that when a, when a child is baptized or an adult is baptized, that they are born again, but at least the Lutheran Church believes that there's faith involved in that. So that makes them, of course, Protestants. Uh, the Church of Christ, I think, believes it's the baptism itself or somehow that that is the appeal of faith to the Lord, but it has to be through baptism. But this is, again, not water baptism. Water baptism only symbolizes the kind of baptism that actually can bring this about. What Paul is talking here is about spirit baptism. The baptism that actually places you in the Lord Jesus Christ 
At the moment that baptism takes place, which is at the moment that you believe, actually it's the baptism actually takes place just prior to that belief because that baptism places you in the Lord Jesus Christ and makes you alive. At that moment then that you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are united with him by faith, at that very moment you die because of your union with Jesus Christ. Now again, we often think about the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ is the guarantor or the surety, the one who guarantees the blessings of the covenant of grace for us, the one who basically ensures that the conditions of the covenant are going to be met so that you and I can enter into heaven. We understand what the Bible says when it says that when Jesus lived the perfect life, he lived that life for you. When he died on the cross, he died on the cross for you. When he was buried, when he was raised from the dead, when he ascended into heaven, when he sat down at the right hand of, of God, he did those things for you. And even now as he's interceding in heaven, he's doing those things for you in order that you might live. Jesus is the guarantee that the conditions of the covenant of grace will be met for you so that you might have life freely simply by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we've talked about that a number of times, but how often do you think about the fact that when Jesus did these things, he not only did them for you, but that now that you are in Christ, you actually went through those things with him because you are united to him. By the way, we talk about this, we use the term vicarious. Uh, the vicarious death of Christ on the cross. Jesus died there for me. My sins were placed on him, and he died in my place. Well, that vicarious nature of Christ's work also applies to everything else he did, too. So that Jesus did these things in our place, but in doing so, we are at, when we trust in him, we're actually identified with him so that we literally go through those things with him, at least in a spiritual sense. We were not on the cross with him. But the fact that we're in Christ and, and what, he has did, what he has done is reckoned to be ours, in that sense, we have gone through these things because of our union with him. Let me use this as an example. When Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, when he sinned against God, that sin was given to you. It was imputed to you. And when God looks at you, at least before you were a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he saw you as one who was guilty of having eaten that fruit. You were not in the garden. You didn't eat of that fruit personally, but you did it vicariously through Adam because he was your representative. Well, in the same way, because of your union with Christ and because his righteousness is imputed to you in the same way, when he obeyed, you obeyed. When he died, you died. When he was buried and raised and ascended and is now at the right hand of God, you went through those things with him. That's why Paul writes, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, a passage which sometimes we don't maybe understand what, what Paul is talking about here. He says this, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now Paul here is talking to Ephesian believers who were on earth, but he said not only did you die with Jesus, but he raised you to life with him and seated you with him in the heavenly places. Now he's talking to a group of people who were then on the earth, but he says you are seated with Christ now in the heavenly places. Well, how can that be? It's because they are united with Christ. Christ is seated in heaven, and you're not in heaven, literally, but you are because Jesus is in heaven. Again, that union, that identification between Christ and his people, in the same way as the identification between Adam and his people, means that whatever your head does, whatever your surety does, whatever your redeemer does, you do as well because you are united to him. So if you're trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior and you are submitting to him as your Lord, 
That passage applies to you too. You're not only here on earth, but you are actually seated in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ because of your union with him. But again, Paul's point, getting back to what we're looking at in our text, is this. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, you were crucified with him. What you were before faith, your old self, your flesh, that was done away with on the cross. You were put to death so that you might be free from sin. As free, he says, as somebody who is actually dead. Look at verse 7. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now ask yourself this question. Can a dead man sin? Can a corpse sin? Well, Paul is saying neither can you if you have died with Christ. Now again, there's a, there are groups that have gone in a particular direction with this. Uh, sadly, even some uh, evangelical groups uh, in, in Wesleyanism that believe that sinless perfection is possible on the basis of texts like this. I mean, after all, if you can't sin any more than a dead man can sin, that means you can't sin at all. And some will even go as far as to teach, and Wesleyans would not say this, but if you sin at all, you're not a Christian. Well, thankfully, that's not what the Bible says, although it would be nice if it were true and we could actually experience that. The fact that uh, we don't experience that if it were true would threaten us because that is not our experience. Now, it doesn't mean that if you're a Christian, you can't sin, because if that's what it meant, then none of us here would be Christians, because we all sin, and we all will sin until we actually die and become like corpses, where we can't sin any longer. Thankfully, our souls will go to be with the Lord, and we will no longer have any desire for sin at all. Now, what Paul is talking about here is what is true of you if you are in Christ. In Christ, your sin has been put to death. In Christ, you are a new creation, a new creature, one that is dead to sin. However, it's in principle. In your experience, you still sin because it is a reality, but one that has not been fully applied, we might say. Not fully applied, but partially applied. Remember, John tells us that we have to admit that this is true, the fact that we do sin if we're Christians at all. Because he says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we have this interesting, these interesting dynamics going on in our lives. If we trusted in Jesus Christ, we have died with him, to sin, the old man has been crucified, the, the body of sin has been done away with, and yet John is telling us, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we have these two principles that we have to bring together. Now again, Paul is not saying that our death to Christ means that we are absolutely dead to sin. This is something that has happened in principle. It's something that is real in Christ and will be consummated in heaven. One day when we actually do go to be with the Lord and we are perfected, we will be absolutely dead to sin. But in the meantime, there is, of course, something that is still alive and active in our souls that we call the remnants of the old man. You know, even though the old man has been crucified, we are still commanded in Scripture to put him to death to put our desires to sin to death, it's still very much alive and very real. However, in principle, is crucified and one day will be absolutely dead. Now, again, that means that our death to Christ, even though it is not an absolute end of sin in our lives, according to scripture, should still make a big difference in the way that you and I live. Even though it's done in principle, even as we are seated with the Lord in heaven, in principle because of our union with Christ does not mean it's simply a truth that we accept and it doesn't actually come in contact with our lives so that we just continue to live the kind of lives that we live before we came to Christ. This death is something to sin, that is, should be something that is working itself out 
in our experience and in the way that we live. As a matter of fact, Paul says, even though it's not absolute, it should make a great difference. And the difference is this. It has freed you from sin so that you are no longer a slave to sin. Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. We are no longer bound to listen to and submit to our sinful desires. We are actually free, free to do what is right. As a matter of fact, Paul says, you were a slave of sin, but you've been set free from that in order now to become a slave of righteousness. Now, Paul, through this text, is calling you to do two things. And these are the things, again, that, that we're going to focus on. One of them this morning, briefly, and the other one this evening. Two things. To put off the old man, to put off sin that no longer has the authority or the power to force you to do its will. And you are to put on the new man that is being renewed in the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this evening we're going to look at what it means to be, to, well, to be raised up with Christ and to be alive to righteousness in Jesus Christ. This morning we're going to consider what it means to be dead to sin. Okay, so first of all, well, we're going to look at two things. What it means to be dead to sin and what this should look like in our lives. So first of all, what does it mean to be dead to sin? Well, I think we already get some idea of what it means just through the introduction. It means not that sin is absolutely dead in our lives. It's still very much active. But it does mean that the Lord has set us free from its power so that sin no longer dominates our hearts. It no longer can dominate our thoughts or our actions. Now, the desire to sin is still going to be in our lives, as we've already seen, because if we say we have no sin, not only is the truth not in us, but we're actually calling God a liar. It's not that you would, of course, never sin and that you wouldn't have struggles with sin. That's not what he is saying because the Bible does, as I've said before, remind us that there is going to be a struggle as long as we live between the old man and the new. Paul says, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Sin is not dead, absolutely, but its dominion is broken. Being free from sin simply means this, that sin can no longer be your master. It can't control you. You don't have to submit to it. You don't have to live in it. You can fight against it. Actually, you can even defeat it by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. As the Bible says that the power of sin is so well broken, so powerfully broken, that you cannot live in sin any longer because that's not something you'll want to do. Now, I think it would be helpful for us to understand what Paul means when he's talking about sin because sometimes I don't think we see sin as the Lord actually describes it in the Bible. What he means by sin is everything that is contrary to God's will. Everything that offends him. Everything that is wrong. That is what sin is. He means the desires of the flesh. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Those are the things that are in the world. And basically, when he says that Sin is no longer uh, your master. He also means the world is no longer your master. He means those things that you want to do that are against what God wants, that are just the opposite of what he says, the things that you want to do that basically have to do with just serving yourself or bringing recognition to yourself or honoring yourself. Basically, it means doing those kinds of things that the people of this world, and perhaps many of you, when you look at the celebrities, what they're actually doing. They're, they're 
doing everything that God says they shouldn't be doing. They're bringing glory and recognition to themselves, for themselves, so that people would look at them and go, ooh and ah. Those are the kinds of things the Lord says that we should put to death because that has self as focus, self-idolizing, self-idolatry, when the Lord, as a matter of fact, wants us to honor him. So it's doing what you want to do to bring attention to yourself, recognition to yourself, honor to yourself at the expense of doing what is really good for you. Jesus says the one who would be greatest in the kingdom is the one who would be least of all, who would humble himself, become the servant of all, the one who would do things secretly and not out in the open for everyone to praise them. So you don't do those kinds of things at the expense of what's good for you, but you, I mean, the things that are of the world, and certainly of what is good for others. If you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, you died with him, and you are dead to sin. And Paul says you should count yourselves as dead. As a matter of fact, when you're tempted, he basically tells you you should simply count yourself as unmovable as a corpse to the things that are sinful. Sadly, we cannot do that perfectly because in our hearts there is still some desire for sin. But we do need to realize that God has given us another desire, which we're going to look at this evening, which frees you from it. If you only had desire to do one thing, you would still be under the power of sin, but you have the desire to do more than one thing so that you are free from the dominion of sin. So to be free from sin, to be crucified with Christ and to be dead with him does not mean that you are absolutely freed from sin, although thankfully in principle you are, but it does mean the dominion of sin is broken so that you no longer have to obey the desires of the flesh. You are freed from that. I think of um, Charles Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be, again, the idea of being fast bound in sin and nature's night and thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I awoke the dungeon, uh, dungeon flame with light. My chains bro off, you know, broke off. My soul was free. And he rose, went forth, and followed thee. That's what freedom from sin means. That's what the death of the old man means. Now let's answer the question, what should that look like in your life? Well, for one thing, it certainly means this, that your inclination, your desire for sin and your desire for the things of the world will not be as strong as they were before coming to Christ. Again, this is the sad part. You'll still have some desire for the world. You'll still have some desire for sin. If you didn't, then you'd never sin. You know, you only do what you want to do, and if you didn't want to sin, you'd never sin. So the fact that when you want to sin, or when you sin, that means you must want to sin. We've already seen that it's not going to be the case that you're going to have no desire for sin. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. You will only be free from that in glory, but your heart will not be completely towards sin because the Spirit of God in your soul will not allow that to happen. Sin has been broken. The grace of God has broken the hold that it had on you, and that means you're going to have a choice, a choice that you wouldn't have before of whether or not to commit sin. Now, before Jesus Christ and before the crucifixion of the old man, you had a choice, but your choice was only between what kinds of sin you were going to commit or what particular degree of sin you were going to commit. You couldn't cut off sin. All you could do was choose among the different types of sin that you wanted to do because you were bound to sin. But now that its power has been broken, you have a choice. And your choice will be against sin. You will choose against it. When sinful desires come into your heart, you will fight against those desires. When sinful thoughts come into your mind, you will resist those sinful thoughts. Now again, your fight's not going to be perfect because of the struggle between the old and the new nature. Sometimes you are going to choose uh, against what you know is what's best for you. But as a new principle and habit of life, you will choose against sin. You will not practice any sin. Listen to what John writes in 1 John 3, verses 5 through 8. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. 
and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. What that means is that if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus has destroyed the work of the devil in your life. He has actually killed the old man in you. We might say the term that's often used is more like this, mortally wounded. The old man is dead, and he is going to die, but he still has some life in him, which means you're still going to have a desire to do what is wrong, but the power that he had over you when he was very strong and healthy is now broken. He cannot wrestle you to the deck anymore. He cannot subdue you. You are free from his power. You can choose to do the right thing. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says you will choose to do the right thing because no one who is born of God can practice sin any longer. The way Jonathan Edwards would put it is simply this, that no one will ever, who is a Christian, will ever sin with his whole heart. He can't because there's a part of him that holds him back. There's that part of him that desires what God wants and who doesn't desire what what, the, what sin in the world is tempting him to do, so he's got a will against a will. His whole will will never be given to any sin. That's the experience of every true Christian. But even more than that, the Bible tells us that our experience can be that of victory, that we can live a godly life. It's not that we're going to be living on the edge of sinning all the time or not sinning with a whole heart all the time. There is going to be a struggle going on all the time, but it doesn't have to be I'm in the sin struggling, but I'm doing what is right, struggling not to do what is wrong, you see. And that's where we ought to be. That's what we need to seek to be. So the power of sin is broken. You have a choice if you're in the Lord Jesus Christ because your old man has been crucified. When, so when you're faced with that choice to sin, you need to count the old man dead and count yourself as unmovable by that sin as a dead man would be if you were already in the grave. So again, this morning I want you to consider that fact and use it to examine yourself. What do you do when you're faced with a choice to sin or not to sin, to do what is right or to do what is wrong? Ask yourself, what is it that you do? If you don't want to sin because what you really want to do is right, because you really love what's right, then the power of sin has been broken in your life. If that love to do what is right is in your heart, the power of sin has been broken. You really have been crucified with Jesus Christ. You really have believed savingly. You really are a child of God. But if you find in your heart that you want to give yourself to the sin without reservation, and, I, and I'm, when I'm talking about reservation there, it has to be the love of God that is the reservation. It can't be, I'm going to get in trouble. It can't be, I don't want the consequences. That's, that is a reservation, but if that's your only reservation, that doesn't show that the power of sin has been broken. If all you want to do is sin because you don't love what is right, then you haven't yet died to sin. You are still bound by it. You are still a captive. The only way it can be broken is if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the only way that you can die to sin and put your sins to death. And so if that is the case with you this morning, then trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you will come to him, he will free you from that bondage. Now what difference does it make? Actually, we're going to see next week in the morning sermon, it makes a big deal of difference. Because Paul tells us you must die to sin if you are to be with the Lord forever in heaven. Verse five, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. If you do not die with Christ to sin, but continue to live in it, 
then when you are raised on that final day, you will be raised to judgment and suffer the eternal consequences of hell. That's the difference it makes. You have to die now to yourself with Christ and be raised again to righteousness or you will perish forever. So trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If that is the case with any of you this morning, if that power of sin has not been broken, the old man will drag you down into hell, literally. He has to be put to death. That sin has to be put to death. You have to live to righteousness. Otherwise, you will die forever. Now this evening we're going to consider that if you have died with Christ to sin, that you've also been raised with him to righteousness, now to do what is right. So I hope that you'll all be here this evening for that particular part of it because it's equally as important. Not only do we have to put off the old man, we need to put on the new man. That's what our Lord calls us to do. Not only to honor him, but he says, if we are true believers, if we are new creatures, that is what we will do. So it's important that we understand it and that we experience it. Let's spend a few moments now in prayer. And let's ask the Lord to search our hearts to show us where we're at. And um, again, as we, if we find that love for the Lord that's broken the power of sin, let's not forget the things that we've just learned. We do have a choice. And the Lord wants us to exercise that choice against sin. Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid, we have died to sin. We can't live in it anymore. If we keep falling into sin, it may say something about our love for righteousness. It's not what it should be. So let's, uh, let's spend a few moments in prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us search out our own experience.